Good morning. Uh, my name's Susan Jeans, and I'm your um, chair for this session today on um, mining and energy jobs in South Australia. Um, I think I'm first supposed to tell you if there is an alarm, you are to assemble outside here, and there's a very nice young woman up the back who will take us to safety, because we assume the alarm is something we don't want to be around. Um, if, I'd like to start by congratulating the South Australian government on this um, very important event. Um, governments are in the business of, man of managing social and economic policy with a core goal of creating jobs uh, in, in our society. And the South Australian government has identified a number of key sectors which will capitalise on our existing resource base, our industry, skills, to grow the jobs of tomorrow. And of course, today we're all here because we're interested in jobs in the mining and energy sector. It's important that you know that there's a lot of collaborative work going on behind the scenes between all levels of government, our industries, our universities, our schools and our TAFEs, that is building on the knowledge bases that we have in these areas. These jobs are and will continue to be in the areas of research and development, planning and approvals, finance, construction, manufacturing, operation and maintenance of equipment, and a range of associated services. So there's a lot of places for people looking to work in the sector to buy into. At the R&D end, and I, I do quite a bit of work with the University of Adelaide, our Institute for Minerals and Energy Resources has identified five key focus areas where research can make the biggest difference in advancing the way we produce minerals and energy here in South Australia. And we have linkages across the world, so we're very well connected into what's going on in the global scale. These areas for South Australia are sustainable energy, developing better tools and processes to identify and understand deep resources, resource engineering to solve problems caused by deep mining operations, complex minerals processing, and defining and recovering tight oil, gas, and geothermal resources in areas where there's very compact rock structures. One of the very important projects we're working on is developing high temperature solar thermal technologies to use in processing um, minerals that we extract and sell overseas. Processing is highly intensive, and if we do it in Australia using fossil fuels, we potentially would more than double our total national greenhouse emissions. So we're working on ways that will improve and dramatically increase our income from mining, but do it in a way that reduces our emissions. But today, the main focus of your speaker, uh, speakers with us today are, is on renewable energy. It's an area that is pretty full of passion. Supporters of renewable energy are passionate about replacing our old ways and delivering and using energy. Those of us who are lucky enough to work in the sector are very passionate about what we do and about contributing to a, a better energy future, and one in which we hope there'll be lots of jobs available. So I thought I'd just give you a few figures to start with on who works in the renewable energy and where. Globally, there are about 9.8 million people employed in the renewable energy sectors. In Australia, we have about 11,150 full-time equivalent jobs, and half of these are in the installation and the, the services around rooftop solar PVs. And to give you an example of how governments can set the pace, a renewable energy target of 50% by 2030 will produce an additional 28,000 Australian jobs in renewable energy. I'm also on the board at ARENA, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, and our investment last year in 12 solar PV farms will produce an additional 480 me megawatts of solar PV uh, power stations, but it'll also bring about 1,000 jobs. So when we invest in, in renewable energy, we're also investing in Australian jobs. In South Australia at the moment, there's about 983 megawatts of large-scale renewable energy projects currently under construction, and there's about 620 people working within, those, uh, within that industry. And our panellists today are right in the middle of some of the exciting changes and new developments in renewable energy. And I'm going to start by introducing to you Mr Mark Twidell. Now, Mark has a very, very interesting position, and under no pressure to have his... Uh, the Tesla battery operating, I think, within a, a few weeks, so we'll, we'll have it up and running. Mark has a long history in the renewable energy sector. He's run um, BP Solar's power 
um, production plant in Western Sydney, and now he's with a very, very well-known, internationally acclaimed and, inter and very interesting company in Tesla. So, Mark, welcome to Adelaide today. Um, he's been spending a lot of time up around Jamestown in the last few months. <laughs> we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Susan, and thanks to the government for hosting. Um, I think there's more than 680 people. We had 100 people yesterday on site um, you know, work, um, involved in building the construction, the battery. There's wind farm construction going on nearby. Um, and you know these are skilled jobs. So I, I don't know who's here looking for jobs or interested in it, but um, got, got a great person for the future here. So I hope uh, you know when you're my age, we have to be generating electricity with no carbon emissions at all. So, you know when you think, and I don't think anyone argues about you know 2050 and 2060. It's going kind to of next five or six years that is the debate. So. Um, it's great to see you know, people for future generations here. Now, I think if I press this, it might click on. Oh, great, I will get past that one. So Tes Tesla's mission is to accelerate the transition to sustainable energy. Our organization would say that the transition is going to happen you know, for the reasons that I've spoken before. I don't think there's any doubt that we need to have a lower emissions energy um, system of the future. Wherever you look, you can see that solar costs are coming down, wind costs are coming down, solar thermal is coming online, hydroelectricity um, has, has got potential. So all of these technologies are, are required, so I'm not here to kind of promote one technology over the other. And our mission is just to try and make it happen a little bit faster. So our CEO has said that if he can make it happen 10 years faster than would have otherwise been the case, that's a job well done. So it's all about accelerating the transition. And one of the nice things about working at Tesla, and I've got some of the team here um, who you know can speak to people afterwards if they're interested, Sarah and Jess can put their hand. Everybody knows the mission of the company and everyone's committed to the mission of the company. Susan mentioned I worked for BP for 25 years and I think the mission of the company changed four or five times over that period and I don't know if anyone can actually really remember what it was but it was really nice to be working um, you know, to this mission and it's a shared mission when they look at the mission of the Australian Renewable Energy Agency for example. <laughs> It's the same thing. So it's a, it's a, it is a mission that if you're working with like-minded companies, you can all work towards the same goal. Um, so everyone who's you know working in in Tesla currently is, is is with this goal in mind, committed to a sustainable future. So we've got solar and wind technology, and I've shown photovoltaics. We've shown photovoltaics and wind here, but there's other technologies as well. And some of those are, are of a variable nature. Others are, are more dispatchable. I'm sure Mary will tell us about, a bit about that in a minute. But one of the things that storage does is it helps balance the, the fact that it gets dark at night. And that's not the fault of solar panels that it gets dark at night. Um, it just happens. Um, and it's some days are windy and some days aren't windy. And we know that. And therefore, batteries help stabilize the grid during those periods. So you can actually dispatch energy when it's needed. But the other thing batteries can do is they can act really, really quickly. So a year ago in um, South Australia, I don't need to tell you what happened, but you had a very sudden series of events, a storm, uh, an interconnector that went overloaded, and things happened within two or three seconds that resulted in the system going down. And if during those two or three seconds there had been enough balancing, fast-acting technologies such as batteries in the system, it just helps stabilize the grid during those period of time. So the idea of batteries isn't to run the whole grid. It's to help shift energy, but stabilize um, during times. And then, of course, there's the vehicles as well. So one third of our emissions come from electrical generation. Another third come from, from, from transportation and the burning of fossil fuels. So a big part of Tesla, and probably the main part today, is the, uh, the electric vehicles. And the, there's one downstairs in the hall. So just a little bit about if there's any people interested in kind of technology and, and engineering you know, careers here. Um, what Tesla, the main thing that Tesla did was to try and get scale. And got scale by realizing that cylindrical battery cells, which are the kind of battery cells that you're probably very familiar with, the, the, the ones there are about the size of a thumb, um, 170 meters high by 21 centimeters diameter, making them in their billions in, in, at scale to drive down the cost and then placing them in battery packs that can then be used in vehicles 
or in the product we call power wall, which sits on the side of a, the wall of a home and can help capture solar energy during the day and then supply it later, or power packs, which is what we're installing in Jamestown, all comes from the same basic um, technology footprint. And so the idea being scale, reducing cost, and driving technology will make the technology more affordable and more easily deployable. And there's quite a lot of it already around. So already around the world, there's uh, close to, I think it's now closer to 130,000 vehicles on the road. Um, storage deployed in what we call stationary applications like Jamestown, and then the whole charging network. So just in order to supply that type of customer base, we need field technicians, we need field engineers, we need service, customer service people on phones, we have um, sales professionals, obviously a lot of financial engineering, R&D, um, so the team here, Sarah, come down to job fairs, not just like this, but also working with local universities to get top talent. Our project manager for the Jamestown project, Coco Wong, um, she's one of our rising stars in California, but she's actually a University of Adelaide girl and uh, very proud of her roots. So, um, you know, great talent coming out of uh, local universities and, and working at a global scale. Uh, just what the power wall looks like, that's it installed. Um, nice home could be down in your coast. Uh, so that will, that battery there will typically store enough energy such that if you have average sun conditions and you have five or six kilowatts of PV on your roof with that one battery, probably 90, or 90 to 95 percent of your energy needs can be covered by yourself, which is, um, helps manage costs and also gives people control of their energy and gives some backup. So if the grid does go down, the, the home can enjoy power. Um, really try and make it easy for people to um, understand how their energy is being used. So a lot of, um, a lot of our engineers are involved in, in developing apps and making it easier and easier for customers to understand their energy use and how they can consume it. Um, you can see here how it can be used. Now, that picture across on the, is it the left-hand side, the one with the funny colours on it? You can, I don't know if you can see, but around about four in the morning, that was when I went away for a weekend with my wife, and uh, I was able to ring up my 19-year-old son, son in the morning. I can say, I see your friends went home just before four in the morning. I don't know if you can see the blue line there. It goes, it's high, and then all of a sudden it drops down. So Once you start to monitor your energy use, you both save money emissions, but you also get a bit more control of your children. So that's a, a, a funny thing that happens. And then we call this the home of the future, but it's almost the home of, to, home of today, at least in California, where the solar roof tile is being installed. So the idea being that solar panels can actually be integrated into the, into the roof. And for those of you that might be in heritage buildings or for, for people that prefer that their roof just looks like a roof, you know, this is the, um, how the technology is going. Battery in the garage there, electric vehicle, controllable loads. So the idea being that more and more of your um, lifestyle can be electric powered, um, environmentally and affordable. Power pack technology. So this is uh, what most of our um, people in South Australia are currently working on currently. Susan mentioned we're, we're lucky enough to be awarded the contract to build a 100 megawatt battery in Jamestown um, in a short period of time. And it needs to be online, um, as you said, very shortly. And that is really a very modular technology. So it's, it's batteries installed on concrete pads. Um, it, it's shown here amongst solar panels, but up in, in Jamestown, it's amongst the Neo N Hornsdale wind farm. And I've got a, a picture coming up. And this technology helps do a, a variety of things. It helps you know, peak shave. So one of the troubles the electrical grid has is high peak loads. So this will help reduce peak loads. Um, stabilize, reduce transmission costs, provides a variety of services into the electrical grid. And one of the other challenges we've got in this industry, and this is an, another area of innovation, is how does the smart grid operate? What are the, the services? And more and more, the engineers that are employed in the sector are about software as hardware. So people interested in kind of developing careers in software, renewable energy has got great potential. Put a little bit of a picture today from one of our um, teams. So there you can see that in the bottom right-hand corner, 
couple of the folk on the, on the project. There's the battery, one of the wind turbines in the background. Um, but a, lo a lot of work in logistics. So, you know, careers in logistics, planning, shipments. Um, you can see on the left there, that was the first of the battery blocks going in 62 days ago. This last weekend, the last one went in. So it was just in a great period. Um, it's very social, you know, so people do enjoy working in the renewable sector because you are outdoors uh, often, you know, gets it. We've got a group of people sitting there having dinner in the railway pub up in Jamestown, and I think they were from six or seven different countries. Um, so, uh, you know, f field technicians is, is, is great work, um, can involve travel. So what we tend to find is that once people develop the skills, then, and what we're developing here in Adelaide is a hub of, of service capability. <laughs> because we've got the first and the world's biggest battery here, it's where we're gonna have a lot of the, the core capabilities. So in time, I think we'll find that our Adelaide-based service team are not just supporting batteries in South Australia, but also across the country and across the region. And just a couple of case studies. I don't know how I'm going for time. I might need to stop soon. So this is, um, this is the this is a pic This was actually taken in July. This picture um, before the battery was built, but the, when the grass was green. So, the battery looks exactly like that today, but the grass isn't nearly so green. Um, so you can see very modular. Um, the little white boxes with red stripes there are inverters. They change DC power to AC, and then the the white boxes, which are about this height, that wide, that look like refrigerators. They are all. They all contain the batteries. And in total, there's 12 million of those little cells that you know, I spoke about installed in a, um, in, in, a, in a very kind of clever way. So there's, it's out, outdoor, it's cooled, um, all, in, all monitored. A lot of engineering around monitoring and data and control. Um, this was a project in Southern California, which is 20 megawatts, 80 megawatt hours. It replaced, it replaced a gas peaking plant. So the... Um, it was, again, built very quickly. So one of the things about renewable energy is how quickly it can be constructed. So solar plants can be brought online within three or four months, whereas often other technologies take a lot, a lot longer, um, conventional coal or, or gas plants. This is a picture in Hawaii of a 13 megawatt solar farm with a 13 megawatt battery. So all of the energy from the solar is potentially stored in that battery and then can be dispatched in the evening. So you can actually see the battery storage is relatively small area compared to the, to the solar panels. Uh, this is an island in the Pacific in American Samoa. So they went from being almost 100% diesel to being 99% solar over the course of three weeks. And it saved money and it generated local jobs. Um, and of course, the environmental benefits. So the technology is coming really, really quickly. This is another way of uh, deploying the technology. So this is in the US, Green Mountain Power, um, where instead of having batteries in one big central location, they're distributed. So you can see just like Adelaide, solar panels on the roofs, batteries installed in each home, but those batteries can then be called upon as if they're one big battery to provide you know, grid services, so backup, peak shaving. So I will stop there, Susan, and uh, hopefully give a little bit of a flavor of some of the things that Tesla are working on, and more importantly, the things that people do when they work at Tesla. Thanks. We'll have uh, the opportunity for questioning Mark and, and our other speakers at the end of the presentations. It's now my pleasure to introduce Mary Grecus from Solar Reserve. Um, Mary's here in Australia because you will all have heard of the very exciting Aurora project that Solar Reserve are going to build um, up near Port Augusta. She's got a long history in innovation and communicating science and innovation to people. So we're really looking forward to hearing from Mary about Solar Reserve's plans and where uh, Solar Reserve see the job opportunities in Australia are. Thanks, Susan. As Susan said, you know, we who work in renewable energy are a passionate bunch. Um, and we're working in unison. We're not competing. We're working together on some fundamental goals. You know, we want to deliver clean energy for our planet, for communities around the world. We want to help lower electricity costs. We want to provide communities with jobs. 
So we're all working together to attain those goals, and we're really excited to be here in South Australia talking to you all who are potentially looking for careers in this passionate field. So, there we go. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Solar Reserve. Um, we're not as much of a household name as Tesla, so I thought I would tell you a little bit about our company. Um, we're based in the US. Um, we have our global headquarters in California, um, and we're opening an office here in Australia for our headquarters in this region in Adelaide. So we are looking to hire some people um, in Adelaide. We've hired, um, I think, five people already for our Adelaide office, and we are um, recruiting for some jobs, so please do stop by our booth for that. Um, Solar Reserve builds large-scale solar power plants. We're a, we're a development company. Um, we do a, a number of things, um, but one of our core competencies is building solar power plants. And we build both solar thermal and solar photovoltaic um, power plants worldwide. We have a technology that our company has developed um, in solar thermal, where we can collect and store the sun's energy in massive quantities. Um, we work a little bit different than batteries. Batteries are great for applications that are more distributed. They're, as Mark said, they're very nimble. Um, we're, we're kind of more of a bulk, um, massive energy storage technology. And I'll talk a, a little bit about the technology and how it works and the associated jobs in a minute. Um, and we also, um, we also, you know, we build solar plants. We, um, we design the technology. We are a technology provider. And we also um, operate power plants. So those are kind of the three cores of what Solar Reserve does. And in each of those core areas, we have job opportunities. We have opportunities in development in technology and technology research. We're continually innovating. We're coming up with you know, better, faster, cheaper ways of doing what we want to do and achieving our goals. And then we have to operate the plants. Um, as I said, we're, we're a global company, um, which is really exciting. Um, we have a flagship project uh, that went online a couple years ago in the US called Crescent Dunes. Um, we are modeling our project in South Australia after our Crescent Dunes project uh, and taking a lot of lessons that we've learned and some new innovations and applying them to the project here. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the technology. And I like to think of it as um, a typical power plant that's broken into two areas. One is the fuel and the other is the power generation. And let's start with the power generation piece. The way that a solar thermal plant generates electricity is exactly, exactly the same as a coal, gas, nuclear plant. Um, we heat water, create superheated steam, turn a turbine, and generate electricity. So we need jobs, and we need people who have skill sets in building power plants, running power plants, um, you know, and, and those are the skills that um, are directly transferable from the coal and the oil and gas and nuclear industries. And then we have the fuel source, which is kind of the best part because it's limitless and free. But how do you take the sunshine, as Mark said, and, and you know, account for the fact that people actually want to power their homes after the sun sets? So what we do is we take very large mirrors and we direct the sun's energy to the top of a tower. And in that tower is a, is a heat exchanger. And that heat exchanger is filled with molten salt. 
So we have molten salt that's pumped up from a tank into the top of the tower, into the heat exchanger. It's heated to over 566 degrees C. It goes back down the tower into a storage tank. And now we have a tank of energy, basically. Kind of like a big salt battery, or a stockpile of coal, or a tank of gas. It's energy that can be used to heat water, make steam, and generate electricity. In our Crescent Dunes facility in the US, we have 1,100 megawatt hours of stored energy. That's a massive amount of energy. Um, it's when the project went online, that amount of storage was equal to all of the world's utility scale batteries combined. So we are a different type of technology serving a different type of purpose. We're, we're a power plant. I mean, that's what solar thermal is. It's a power station, just like a coal station or, or a nuclear station. Um, and, and that's why um, you know, our, our jobs are a little unique from the solar PV industry. You know, we have the power generation side, which are jobs that are very familiar to many people throughout the communities here. And then we have the fuel side, where there are some unique technologies that deal with the mirror technology, which we call heliostats. You know, how can we control them? So there's a lot of engineering. There's software, there's hardware, there's controls. Um, so it's a really exciting industry with a myriad of jobs, some very familiar and some kind of new and exciting. And now Aurora, our project in South Australia, about 30 kilometers north of Port Augusta. We're tremendously excited to be here. We're excited that we're starting to recruit for jobs for this project. Um, construction on the project will start in 2018. So in early 2018, we need to start ramping up you know, the construction jobs. We'll have about 650 positions during the construction phase, which will last about 30 months. Um, we have a flyer over at our booth, come and get it, that lists all the different types of construction jobs that we'll be looking to hire for. And a lot of them will be really similar to the types of construction jobs for building a, a new power station. Um, and we need all kinds of skill sets for that. And then once the plant goes online, we'll need about 50 people to, to maintain and operate it. We'll need control room op operators, people with experience on the generation side and working with delivering energy to the electric grid. Um, one of the things that's really exciting um, about the technology, too, is that if you look at this picture, you'll see that in the middle is the power block. That's where all the power generation is. Um, but when you look, at, you look at how big the facility is, you can hardly see it, right? So a big part of what we're building are the mirrors. If you look at that picture, with the man standing next to it, you can see exactly how large the mirrors are. They're over 96 square meters, and there's over 10,000 of them. And they're made from glass and steel. They have concrete foundations. They obviously need to be assembled locally. And so there's a lot of opportunity in a solar thermal facility for local content. And we are pretty passionate about trying to hire locals and provide as much local content as we can for our facilities. And then a little bit about the jobs. Um, since I'm the communications marketing person, I had to add a marketing flair to all of this. So that we have a website um, called We Are Solar Thermal, www.wearesolarthermal.com. Um, and we put this together to illustrate what kind of jobs are available for the solar thermal industry. Um, our Aurora project is going to be exciting, but even more exciting than that, we're hoping to build at least six projects like that over the next 10 years in South Australia. We're hoping to help develop skill sets and suppliers here in South Australia that can 
supply into solar thermal plants in South Australia and across Australia broadly. Um, so it's really exciting. And, you know, we are solar thermal. We are passionate about what we're doing. Um, we're hoping to get everyone excited about it and help, hope you're going to help share our passion. Um, and true to a marketing person, I have a little video that I wanted to show you. The power of the future. What if we could replace coal or nuclear while keeping the hardworking people that build and run our power plants? What if this new energy came from the sun and could be stored in salt, renewable and clean? Well, it can because of solar reserve. And the technology that will power the future is already here. We are solar thermal. From construction to operations, welders to control room operators. At Solar Reserve, we're dedicated to providing clean, renewable energy to the world and to the men and women who make it possible. Solar Reserve, the power of the future. So thank you very much, and um, please stop by our booth and, and chat with us. Well, thanks very much, Mary. This is a very exciting time in South Australia at the moment with both of you. Now, our next speaker is perhaps not as at, at, at the um, apparent announcement and, and interesting end of things, but Mark Vincent actually has to help make things work in the system. He is a, a good homegrown story for those of you who are considering a career in electrical engineering. He is an electrical and electronic engineer, educated at the University of South Australia. So he's a great example of if you really are interested in this field, you can study and work here and go on to find a career in Adelaide and you don't have to go anywhere else, which most of us are really happy that we've been able to do. Um, Mark um, works for South, for South Australia Power Network and is responsible for imagining and making the future happen in, with, in I suppose, accommodating all the new technologies in solar and, um, and smaller installations into our network, not the big transmission grids. So Mark's going to come and tell us a little bit about what he does and a little bit about where SA Power Network see the future. Okay, let's see how we go. Um, just a little footnote on that is I actually started out my career as a tradie, so as a tradesperson for SA Power Networks, went through a range of progressions, and I think that is certainly one of the benefits of, of joining a, a large company is that have those, those job opportunities. Um, what I want to cover, so my role in SA Power Networks is effectively to help us transform our business to support this stuff, right, that these guys have been talking about. Um, our industry is pretty much being turned on its head from what it used to be, um, from centralised generation, coal-fired, gas, etc., to lots of distributed resources and batteries and brand new things that our customers are doing. That's actually not a trivial challenge, so that makes our life very interesting. That's my job, best job in the world, I reckon. Um, so what I want to cover today is a bit about SA Power and then a little bit about industry change and then I'll talk about what that means for, for jobs in South Australia. So, SA Power first, um, look a bunch of you probably know this, but SA Power are the poles and wires business in South Australia. We don't generate electricity, we don't sell electricity, we just carry it from effectively large bulk distribution points and distribute it to customers around the network. Um, we've got about 2,000 direct employees, a whole lot of contractors as well, a um, bunch of depots. Um, nearly a million customers, and just a point of interest is, and we, we distribute something like about 10 billion units of electricity per annum through our network. Now, through the wonders of technology, I'm hoping I'm also going to be able to show a video. We'll, we'll see what happens, um, which just, I think, describes in just a couple of minutes what it would take me probably a half an hour to talk through, which is some of the industry change that we're seeing. All of us depend on a safe, reliable and secure supply of electricity, from small and large businesses to families like the Joneses. But the way we generate our electricity is changing, and that's being driven by our customers. 
Up until recently, most of our energy would come from large centralised generators. But today, more and more energy is being generated locally. Nearly a third of our customers, like the Joneses, have installed solar panels to cut their energy costs. They're also considering investing in batteries to store the energy they get from the sun. In the not too distant future, it's likely they'll buy an electric vehicle as well. Coupled with sophisticated energy management software, families like the Joneses are increasingly going to be able to take control of how and when they use energy and where they get it from. Our job is to make sure that the electricity network is able to support these choices and investments that customers are increasingly making. However, our current distribution network was only designed to support one-way centralised electricity generation rather than complex flows of energy from sources distributed throughout the system. Soon we expect that more than half of the community's energy will come from these distributed resources. Just like traffic in peak hour, if we don't manage this transition well, the network will soon become congested. We've been talking to customers and the community to develop a future network strategy to support this shift to more distributed sources of generation. At its core, our strategy is designed to support growth in customer choice, to respond to the changing needs of customers. To do this, we know the network will need to be smarter and more finely managed than before. For some customers, there might be a little change. Some might just want our advice. Others like the Joneses will want new services from the network to support their investment in solar and batteries. We may even help some communities go off grid. But our commitment to providing a safe, reliable and secure supply of energy will continue. Whatever choices you or the Joneses make, at SA Power Networks, we're committed to ensuring our network can support you to make it happen. So just to kind of round that out, so effectively it is almost as if the industry is being turned on its head. So the vast amount of energy, at times 100% of South Australia's energy being provided by distributed resources, customers own batteries, solar systems installed in their own homes. And the network wasn't designed to go that way. So customers are making these new choices and we have to adapt. So what that means, oh, sorry, I'll, have, I'll show another picture. Um, so we think with some of these trends, and there's a whole lot of explanation I could give as to why Customers are going to do this. Basically, solar panels, for example, are really, really cheap electricity for your home. Orders of magnitude lower cost than what you're paying from the grid. Um, batteries are gradually coming down in, in price, and we're seeing electric vehicles and so forth take up even more and more. Um, so what that means, some quick back-of-envelope calculations I did on the way here. Um, so customers over that period, just in South Australia alone, will be investing something like about $3 billion over that next sort of 20 year period in their own assets. And I reckon probably be safe to say that large grid scale developments um, like the solar storage and we're talking about near Port Augusta, um, the Tesla battery, other things on the grid side, probably at least another 3 billion perhaps on top of that. On the network side, to support that, will probably be spending something like in the order of $10 billion. Actually, that's not just to support, that's a whole lot of normal stuff that we do as well. But um, what it's going to be more and more about is not us building new network or new poles and wires or some of those traditional things. It'll be much more clever control systems, automation, the stuff that sits behind that and basically squeezes more out of the current network than we can do today to support these interesting and new technologies. I actually went one step further and said, so I wonder what that sums up to, and I reckon it's probably a lot of jobs in South Australia, which is very good news um, for the people, people in this room. Um, so I want to skip through to just the sort of things that SA Power Networks will be looking, looking for as we sort of go forward into that new world. And I think there are some things that are a little bit different. So, you know, you, you might have, we're one of the largest employers in the state with a couple of thousand people, and we have got the traditional, the trades, the technical, the engineering, but more and more we will be looking for brand new skill sets. So things like data specialists and definitely an increased focus on ICT. I'm sure you've all heard about big data and all this sort of stuff. Well, that's happening to our industry just as much as everyone else, and we're looking for data scientists and people that can make use of all this information to squeeze a lot more out of our network than we could ever do in the past. In terms of what those individual candidates are, are looking for, um, diversity is a big focus of the company because we really can get more value from a diverse workforce. 
We're also looking for people that are perhaps a little bit broader. We used to always want to employ people that are, I think we call them I-shaped people. They're people that are very deep, very narrow. They're specialists in a particular area. But more and more we want what we call T-shaped people. People that have got perhaps a broad understanding across a whole lot of skill sets, but equally they've got their area of specialty that they can, they can drive down into. Agility, digitally capable, I think, I think you're familiar with most of, the, most of the buzzwords, but I think the rate of change and the complexity of what we're starting to deal with requires new things from the people coming into our business. So I think that's pretty much, um, you know, we are looking to recruit, we've recruited something like about, um, I think, 400, 500 apprentices over the past five to 10 years, uh, a stack of engineering graduates and we're always looking for new and talented people. As all the other speakers have said, um, please come around and visit our booth. I know some of my team are there this afternoon and they'd be delighted to talk to you. Thank you. Okay, now we've got time for some questions. It might be nice if you um, uh, have a question and when you put your hand up, uh, someone comes to you with a microphone. Um, you say who you are and perhaps what your, your area of interest in, the, in being here at a job expo and being at the mining and, and uh, energy um, panel ses uh, session. So do we have any questions? Hi, um, thanks for coming out today, guys, um, and seeing this innovation um, being put into practice. Uh, my name's Ross. I'm actually a nurse, but have a deep interest in the way the world's transitioning and changing um, and I wanted to know or get your opinion on yes this sort of transition is really important and really urgent but how soon do you actually see this sort of stuff happening we're gonna are we gonna see a big pushback from the grid and the power systems that we have now um, I know electric vehicles are becoming more of a niche product but they're becoming less and less but we still have such a high cost as more of a luxury vehicle so that transition, do you see it happening rapidly now with the cost driving down or is it too much political um, pushing um, against that, that we might not see this transition as fast as we want? Because that's the big worry because we really need to decarbonise quickly um, based on Paris projections and the IPCC. Okay, I think Mark's keen to I'd take love, that question. I'd love to have a go at that. <laughs> um, we, we are the electricity industry, okay? Um, so I think, and I think I can also safely say for others in the sector, retailers um, and generators, it's, it's not our industry that's pushing back. It's the government and stability, direction in terms of government policy at a federal and state level. Actually, congratulations to the state, but anyway. Uh, SA is pretty amazing. Yeah, SA is doing pretty well. Um, this change is inevitable. So customers will make these choices and there's nothing that the, even if it wanted to, there's nothing the industry could do to hold it back. Within the next five to 10 years, we anticipate that at certain times, our whole state will be powered by rooftop solar. That's gonna happen no matter what. That's just, that's even quite conservative <laughs> forecast. So this change is happening, whether, whether <laughs> you know, um, whether federal government or whatever likes it or not. Um, and our challenge is how we can most efficiently enable it, because the, the challenge, sorry, I won't, I won't go on, let other speakers, electric vehicles may be interested here, but um, let the other speakers have a go, but um, our challenge is simply that customers are making very large investments as well, even, you know, three billion even in South Australia. What we don't want to do is customers are making investments and grids are making investments and they're just not meshed and they're basically wasting money because you've got resources that aren't being used efficiently. So our challenge is an integration in making sure we, we get them to, the popular word these days, orchestration, to, to work nicely together and get a very efficient outcome. That's very possible. Do you believe that the um, National Energy Guarantee is more of an inhibitor or actually just some certainty now? Um, I'll start that with Mark's opinion. Um, <laughs> Mark's opinion um, is that it at least is a way forward. So if we can get almost, almost in, the, in the absence, in a policy vacuum, um, something the states and the feds could agree on would be better than nothing at all. I think, um, again, Mark's opinion is a, is a carbon tax is actually a much more efficient way of going about these things, but it's not a bad balance in my opinion. Can, can you all hear me okay? Yep. Um, you know, we're finding that really it's 
often a matter of economics as well, right? So we, we want to build solar thermal power plants, but we're competing against, in many markets, coal plants and gas plants, and we have to operate as well as they do, and we have to be cost competitive, otherwise it just doesn't make sense. So, you know, in the, the tender that was put forth by the South Australian government, um, in which we were awarded our Aurora project, for a portion of the electricity, we actually did bid against some gas generators, and we outbid them. Our price was lower. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how we have to do it. That's why we, we need people, we need talent, and we have to continue to innovate. We have to work with government entities who are doing research. We have to continue to improve our functionality, to add different resources to the grid to get to a low carbon or no carbon you know, grid. And we have to be cost competitive. So that's, that's you know, what we have to do. We have to, you know, we're a business. We have to compete against other businesses, despite the fact that we are passionate about renewable energy. It appears that um, the, because everything's getting cheaper in the renewable energy sector, it's the fact that it's not transitioning as fast as it is is based more on ideology than mass and numbers, because if it were based on mass and numbers and not policy or ideology, we probably would have this transition a lot faster because it is becoming fundamentally cheaper worldwide, which is the way I'm seeing it, or in this country especially, when we've been an export of coal and steel and that sort of thing for, as our livelihood for so many decades. It is a, dif it is a difficult transition. And you, your original question about the National Energy Guarantee is, is probably an imperfect um, base for which this trans transition will, will occur from the time it's implemented. In regard to the, the NEG, um, it's, um, the devil is always in the detail and we haven't yet seen how um, the various capabilities of renewables and their um, emissions reduction uh, contribution will be, will be priced, basically. We're also not seeing Mary's um, uh, solar thermal power plant is competing um, on, on, a, on the basis of a coal, against a coal-fired power station, but that coal-fired power station power station in the policy regime that we have doesn't penalise the external impact of that coal-fired power station. And location and where you put your um, power generation plant within the grid isn't effectively um, priced to take account of the, the benefit that, that that power station provides to the overall system adequately. We have um, an imperfect system, but I don't think, as, as Mark said, anybody's going to stop it. We're, we're seriously... Um, on the way. Um, and I have a little bit, just a little bit of empathy for those who are concerned about cost because I think one of the things we have to grapple with is that there are a whole lot of um, low income earners and elderly people, people on a pension who can't afford their electricity bills and they're getting dragged into this mm. um, debate which is really about power and the environment. Mm. Um, and so it, it is murky and it's not straightforward and you're not you're depicted as being pro-renewables and therefore progressive or anti-renewables and therefore, um, you know, a dinosaur. Mm. It's not that simple. It is a very, very complex um, policy framework. And each of the states and the Commonwealth have to agree to, to changes to rules to run the national market. Mm. It's not easy. But that doesn't mean to say that the revolution is, is stopping. It's, it's just going to take off um, more and more. It's very interesting that um, you can create these projects into scale in a relatively short period of time when we have nuclear power plants and coal-fired stations that take decades with, you know, um, getting permits and everything sort of thing up and running, but you can get these projects going relatively quite quickly and to scale, so it's... It, the inevitability is there, but it's also very impressive to the scale and the time frame that you're able to do it. Yes. Indeed. We have another questioner. He's just put his hand up. Uh, good afternoon. I'm currently studying towards an advanced diploma in electronic engineering at Regency Park TAFE, looking to go on to the pathway into one of the universities after that. Is there any one particular university course that has proven itself to be proactive with linking what it does with the sustainable technology sector, or what would you, off, what would you advise? 
I think I'll, I'll simply make a comment that, that all the universities are more and more trying to engage with industry to make sure that the, the skills of the students that are coming out are fit for purpose when they come out of their degrees and get ready for the industry. And there's quite a bit of work being done as part of a project, it was touched on in the video, the, the electricity network transformation roadmap that's looking at kind of a national pathway to make sure that the unis have got syllabus that is meeting the needs of the industry going forward. Because the issue I have at the moment is they all say that. They, yeah. they all say that yeah. they're, 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 they're at the cutting edge of technology, but I'm trying to sort of work out where I choose which one, who's... I think the answer is that's true. And they're all just at the cutting edge of technology in slightly different areas. So I think my advice, if anything, would be what's your particular area of interest and which of the universities perhaps is focusing most on that area? I think it's true that industry is, uh, universities are engaging much more with industry to make sure that their research fields um, and their postgraduate work is in areas that are relevant to industry. I chair the Centre for Energy Technologies Advisory Board at Adelaide University and we have industry people, mining companies, um, uh, people who build power stations all on the, on the board to provide the centre with the advice on where they need to be focusing the large amount of money that they have to, um, uh, the universities have to um, spend on research. Now I think we have one, I think we're getting pretty close to the end, so I think we've got one more question just up behind you. Yep, well, I'll make it quick. Uh, so I'm Daniel Alexandridis, I studied uh, petroleum, and, petroleum and mechanical at uh, Adelaide Uni, uh, engineering that is. I'm currently a public servant, so working for the state government, and I just had a question for uh, Mark Vincent, just about um, SA Power Network. So you were saying that uh, you, know, you handle all the distribution and obviously you're going to be a, a key player when it comes to the transition. Uh, kind of, you know, distribution is, is all up to you, as I say, power when it works at the moment. Uh, but then you had Mr. Twido coming across saying, you know, Tesla's goal is to bring forward that transition 10 years, you're saying. Uh, and I'm just wondering, so you're, you're going to help with this uh, transition, but do we know what SA Power Network's future is going to be, or will it completely change? Will anybody who wants to get involved now have a completely different job in, in 15 years? <laughs> or that's, um, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, so I think just one thing I'll observe is uh, SA Power Network, which is in the renewable energy industry, right? Uh, whether we like it or not. Um, I think that, and um, some of you visit our innovation centre. Um, You'll have heard me talk about this at length. Um, so we think that the network will retain a, an amenity I'll describe as for a long time. You know, Tesla's big battery doesn't work to power X thousand homes unless it's connected to a grid. Um, the solar thermal plant cannot get its energy to homes unless it's connected to a grid. Um, we think that more and more customers will be largely independent with their own solar battery system. That's the Tesla story. But you note the Tesla story didn't have those customers coming off grid. It was still um, using the grid to top it up and basically as a path to market. And I think that's what we see our role more and more transitioning to is we're enabling a brand new market at the distribution level for customers to share and trade electricity with each other. So we think we're gonna be relevant for a long time. Does that mean in remote parts of the network that we might pull back? Yes because long stringy remote power lines to far-flung regions is pretty expensive. Um, but we'll have still have a network there just to be serving a local community, maybe not connected back to the main grid. So, so we think we're going to be there for another, um, another 50, 100 years and we'll still need um, guys in trucks and girls in trucks, right? or guys a generic term, um, putting up wires and, and pulling them down again. And I think we'll give the last word to Mark Twidle. I was just going to say there's two, I mean, from Tesla's perspective, there's two things we need to be successful. We need customers and we need electricity networks. <laughs> and without either one of those, our business plan has got no future. So, you know, electricity networks are the, a trading place of the future. Like, electricity is amazing. It travels at the speed of the light. And you can only generate something if at exactly the same time there's someone else consuming it. So it makes no sense at all to not use what is a national treasure, which is you know, electricity networks. And I think the fact that you've got organizations like South Australia Power Networks employing people like Mark who are kind of looking forward, not looking backwards, is um, you know, it's great.
So yeah, I think it's there, and they are going to be the jobs of the future. They're going to be some fun stuff's going to be happening. Thanks, Mark. So as you can see, we're all very collegiate in the renewable energy sector. Um, there is always that bit of commercial tension um, relating to confidentiality and market share. But generally, all of us are pretty enthusiastic about the role that we're playing in, the, in the, what is an inevitable transformation that is unstoppable. And so for those of you interested in following up, I would advise that you go down and talk to the, to the booths and you make contact over the internet or um, however, uh, with the universities who are looking to, um, or who, who run the courses to see where the best fit for you is. So good luck and thank you very much for coming today.